Today is program evening event. Today's evening event actually is called Starships, and uh, Dr. Warden is going to give us a fascinating talk about uh, how to treat the miniature spacecraft. He's going to go at speed of 20% the speed of light toward the planets, other stars, our set up solar system. But before we start, actually, I would like to thank our sponsors and the members of the local organizing committee uh, here in the Netherlands. Uh, as you know, ICO always try to promote uh, science, engineering, and all technologies to the local community. And this is one of the events that we try to do that to the local public as well. Uh, before we start, if you can ask you please to make sure your phones are on silent. And uh, in case there's a fire or an emergency, we have two emergency exits here on the right. So, also would like to point your attention, actually, this hall is where Einstein used to give some, some lectures here a long time ago. So we are very privileged today to be, to be in this venue here. So uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Warden, it's a great pleasure to, to introduce Dr. Pete Warden. He was actually, he had uh, a distinguished career in the Air Force for about 25, 29 years. And he retired from the Air Force as Brigadier General. He was also a director of AIMS Research Center in uh, Silicon Valley, where he was a director from 2006 until 2015. Uh, he's also been a faculty member since 1994, and he is also a member of the Board of Trustees of the International Space University. Uh, also, he's uh, authored or co-authored about 150 scientific uh, journals, uh, international journals, and one of the most prestigious ones. Okay. Uh, currently, he's the chairman of the Breakthrough Foundation, uh, which is funded by um, uh, Stephen Hawking and, and Dr. Yuli Werner. And actually, uh, Pete used to be my boss at uh, NASA, actually. So I used to report to him. So he, and I was there as a deputy chief scientist. So I'm really pleased to have him here. And something uh, interesting, actually, tomorrow he will be knighted in, uh, in Luxembourg. So please welcome and congratulate Dr. Pete. Oscar party, which is the coolest party in Hollywood. 
uh, I don't get invited to it, by the way. Uh, but uh, the uh, the founder of the Breakthrough Prize is Yuri Milner, who I work for now, a uh, Russian investor who lives in Silicon Valley. Uh, had founded the Breakthrough Prize in 2012, and uh, it, his concern was that scientists uh, were not receiving the right kind of attention from the public. Uh, in fact, he looked at the list of the most admired scientists, and most people only put Einstein on it, maybe Hawking on a few of them. So he said, well, let's fix it, and because he's an entrepreneur, so let's put money into it. So we found, he founded the Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics, which is $3 million, it's three times the size of that Swedish prize I'm not supposed to mention. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, but they were looking to have a venue to do the prize ceremony. Uh, Valley will know the NASA Center there, NASA Ames, uh, has these large 1930s airship families. And uh, so, the, 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 so they thought that was a good place to have them. Uh, and for about the 15th time, I almost got fired by signing an agreement with them. Uh, but uh, the, uh, this was a really cool ceremony. We have some Hollywood A-list actor and all these billionaires. And uh, it's the only black tie I've heard in Silicon Valley, so I had to buy a black tie. And, and, and I got invited because I was the landlord. By the way, Sergey Brin still doesn't get a black tie. Uh, but uh, since the start of the prize, they added uh, uh, Four or five additional prizes in life sciences, uh, like Zuckerberg, your founder of Facebook, who supports them, uh, Sergey Brin, the co founder of Google, and Whiskey, the founder of 23andMe, Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba, uh, and Pony Ma, the founder of Tencent, and support these. Uh, and then there is now a prize in mathematics as well. So it was a really cool ceremony. Like I said, as the landlord, I got invited. Uh, but I, I, you know, it's kind of, I have to show it's kind of a neat venue. Uh, it's broadcast live, uh, unlike that Swedish thing, uh, which I think is broadcast live and nobody watched it. Uh, although Einstein did give a lecture there, too. Uh, the, uh, the, the ceremony itself is a pretty cool thing. Uh, you know, and we really try to make heroes of the scientists. Uh, the, uh, so the, typically, uh, the, the prizes are given. Uh, 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 this is Helen Hobbs, who won it in life sciences for her work in, in genetic uh, heart uh, diseases. Uh, you might recognize the kid there. Uh, uh, and that's her. She played in Popular the Vampire Slayer. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it's a pretty cool event. Uh, one thing I'd like to bring to your attention is, is every year we started about three years ago, we have a junior breakthrough prize. So if any of you know, you know high school students between the age of 13 and 18, we, we just closed for this year, but next year we open in the spring uh, for a couple minute video uh, the, uh, on some science principle. Uh, the winner gets a $250,000 US dollar scholarship. Uh, the, uh, uh, the school gets $150,000 laboratory. And to me, one of the neatest things we give the teacher a fifty thousand dollar check that inspired the the, uh, the, the, the young person. Uh, the first year, the young man that won it didn't tell his teacher, <laughs> and so we called him. He thought it was a call from Nigeria or someplace, and he wanted his bank account. <laughs> he finally got the check. Uh, but uh, this is kind of a neat thing. Uh, uh, the two years ago, we gave it to two young ladies. Uh, one, uh, Antonella Massini from Peru. Uh, the other one is Deanna C from, uh, from Singapore. Uh, last year, Hillary uh, uh, Andales from the Philippines uh, won it. And I'm really pleased that three out of the four winners so far have been young ladies. And, and so this is a really cool uh, event. And uh, yeah, I share the selection committee, so it's kind of neat. What? Uh, yeah, I, yeah. Well, I think it's just fun with power. <laughs> so uh, that, that's kind of a real neat thing. But what I'd like to do is, is chat now about the main topic. Uh, the, uh, to me and to many others, the key questions are life and the universe. Uh, and it's really kind of three fundamental questions. Uh, and this is important because we don't know how long life's going to last here. Uh, this is a really cool picture. 
uh, you know, it could end, you know, tomorrow. Well, probably not, because we, we don't know of any big asteroids that are about to hit us. Uh, but uh, to me, one of the most interesting questions is, is uh, uh, the possibility of wiping out all life on Earth. Uh, the, uh, and I really enjoyed the quote from Carl Sagan. Uh, he said, if the dinosaurs had a space program, uh, life would be a lot different here on Earth. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of things that can end life on Earth. Uh, this one I find kind of neat. Uh, this is called the death bubble. Uh, and, uh, and this is kind of an introduction to why it's important to, to go fast. Uh, it turns out that, that string theorists, who probably are full of it, but it might not be, uh, say the universe can be represented as a uh, nth dimensional quantum state. Now, those of you that take quantum physics, uh, like people that used to sit in this room, uh, understand that, that, that there's three states of, of any quantum, or three quantum states. You can be stable, and if the universe is a quantum state, it can be stable, which is great, it means nothing will happen for a long time. It can be unstable, which means we wouldn't be here, uh, or it can be metastable. Now, metastable means that you're in kind of a, an excited state that could de-excite. Uh, now, much of the data that people collect suggests that the universe is in a metastable state. And what that says is some place in the universe it could drop to a stable state, uh, in which case a new, new universe is formed, which is what these things represent. Uh, and the old universe is erased. So this could have happened somewhere in the universe now, and the, uh, the the end of the universe is, is approaching us. Now, it turns out you can escape this if you can go close to the speed of light. So just keep that in mind. Uh, so these are the three questions. Uh, is there other life in the universe? Is there intelligent life elsewhere? And I have to say that, you know, if you go to most nations' capitals, particularly mine, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> and can we travel between the stars? Uh, the last question is, is relevant to not only can you escape death bubbles, but uh, uh, if there was life elsewhere in the universe, uh, there's the, it's called the Fermi Paradox, which suggests that, that eventually you can travel between the stars, that life uh, would be noticeable. And the paradox is that uh, other than a few people that are drunk too much, uh, there isn't any evidence of aliens. Uh, yes, I'm an Air Force general, and I don't know of any evidence of aliens. Uh, let me talk a little bit about life on Earth. Uh, all life on Earth is, is appears to come from a single origin. Uh, there's two forms of, of uh, uh, microbial life, bacteria and archaea. Uh, a third form that is more complicated, and I'll get to this in a second, uh, uh, called eukaryotes, which we are, but there's also single cell eukaryotes. Now, the evidence is that these the simple single cell uh, bacteria and something called archaea, which by the way we didn't even know about until about 30 years ago, uh, that have a very simple DNA code, uh, a few million base pairs of, of, uh, of uh, uh, DNA, uh, the uh, very simple cell code, uh, the, the DNA is not contained in a nucleus. Uh, and as far as we know, this started about a few hundred million years after the Earth began. Now, whether it came from the, it, it arose on Earth or came from elsewhere is a, is a very open question. But for three billion years, nothing happened. Uh, but then eukaryotes emerged, which have a much more complicated DNA, which is what we are, that up to billions of base pairs contained in a nucleus. Uh, and one of the most interesting things is the cell contains hundreds, if not thousands, of, uh, of energy-producing uh, uh, organelles, uh, in the case of animals with called mitochondria. Now, the current theory is that sometime about a billion years ago, give or take 200 million years, a uh, bacteria consumed, or archaea consumed bacteria, and formed a symbiosis. Now, What's significant about this is that the, the bacteria became these organelles which, in the case of, 
of animal cells or mitochondria in the case of, uh, of, uh, of uh, plant cells or chloroplasts. These are energy producing body inside the cell. Uh, and there's thousands of them. What this did is increase the amount of energy available to the cell by three orders of magnitude, which allowed for much more complex information because energy is information. Uh, and this is apparently what enabled you know, complicated life, uh, including us on Earth, to, to arise. So there's really three questions. The first one is that life on Earth was a very singular event. And we may be very much alone, that, that life only emerged on Earth. The second one is that life is, is complex, or life is, uh, is common. So we'll find microbial life everywhere, but the symbiosis that produce eukaryotes is very rare. So we'll find you know, microbial life everywhere, but intelligence may be extremely rare. We may still be very alone. The third one, which is probably the coolest, is that life is common, and so too is intelligence. So our program is designed to kind of answer some of these questions. Uh, on uh, July 20th, 2015, uh, the anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing, Yuri Milner, which you see here on the stage, and Stephen Hawking, who until his death a few months ago with our senior scientific advisor, announced the breakthrough initiatives. And the first initiative was a revitalized search for extraterrestrial intelligence. The first searches began in the 1960s for scientific searches, based on some papers written in the late 1950s by a number of physicists, including Philip Morrison, who I think probably lectured here as well, uh, that suggested that, that he did some calculations that said that radio waves about 1.5 gigahertz would transmit through much of the galaxy. And so he suggested this would be the, the, the information that an alien may try to signal us and uh, begin to look for that. Uh, now the key scientist that started this actual looking was Frank Gray, who at the age of 87 is our senior uh, advisor on, this is called the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Uh, and uh, this has gone on for about 50 years, and except for a few arguable events, there's no positive results. Uh, although I will say that there was a, in the 1970s, there was one detection called the WOW signal because the person that saw it wrote WOW by it, which I would have too. I probably would have put more. Uh, but uh, uh, not much has been done the last decade or so. Uh, the U.S. government tried to fund some of this, actually at my former center, as the Haynes had got stopped by, uh, how do I say this, Del? Well, I want idiots in the U.S. Congress. Uh, so since then, there's only been private funded, funding for it. But uh, Yuri Milner committed 100 million U.S. dollars for a 10-year program, uh, not about looking for aliens. Uh, although I must say, today is U.S. Independence Day, uh, and I really like this picture because it represents what many Americans think should happen. Uh, <laughs> I can't say anything more. <laughs> the, uh, see, the aliens could be good after all. Uh, but at any rate, we're, we're doing scientific stuff. So uh, the, uh, uh, we obtained time on the world's largest radio and now optical telescopes. We have 20% of the time on this telescope, this is the Green Bank, uh, 100 meter, it's the largest steered antenna in the world. Uh, the uh, because those of you that understand geometry know we can't look at all the sky from the northern hemisphere. Uh, we have a second large radio telescope. This is the Parkes uh, radio telescope in Australia. It's at 64 meters. Uh, this, by the way, is a very historic instrument. It was the one that received the signal from the first moonwalk. Uh, so we have 25% of the time on that. Uh, we also are looking for optical signals, recognizing that increasingly that lasers are being used for communication, so we're starting to scan the sky, uh, look for laser communication signals. Uh, this is the world's largest radio telescope, the FAST radio telescope in China. Uh, we signed an agreement uh, about a year ago with the, the, the National Astronomical Observatory of China 
Uh, we'll be using about 15% of this in concert with Chinese radio astronomers uh, to look for signals. By the way, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, we ought to be able to see signals uh, that, you know, we've been broadcasting I Love Lucy for half a century. Uh, so, but it turns out that even from the nearest star, if they were broadcasting I Love Gork, uh, that this is the first instrument we have that could detect it. So, from a, like a TV broadcast. So, so this is a very important instrument. Uh, we're using a lot of other telescopes. This is the oldest large telescope, the 74 meter John Bank instrument built in the 50s. Uh, and we just signed an agreement with South Africa. This is the, the first installment of what eventually be a square kilometer collecting area. It will have 2,000 radio telescopes. Uh, a week from this Friday, it will be dedicated by the South African government. Uh, we've signed an agreement to use it. Uh, this instrument is the first one capable of scanning a lot of different stars simultaneously. Uh, we intend to look at the million nearest stars, largely using this instrument. Uh, that gets us out to 1,000 light years. So yeah, if there's somebody trying to get in touch with us, we hopefully will find it. Now, one of the other things we looked at, and this is a very controversial area, is uh, should we message aliens? And maybe should, should we send messages without knowing there's any aliens? Uh, maybe too late. This is the famous Arecibo message that Frank Drake and, and his graduate student Carl Sagan uh, transmitted uh, in the 1970s. Uh, I don't know if I was an alien, I could get anything out of this. <laughs> so it's probably no danger, uh, other than, than beings here look like stick figures. Uh, the, uh, this was transmitted to a collaborator cluster 25,000 light years away, so it'll probably be a while before we get an answer. Uh, but at any rate, this has caused quite a lot of controversy. We considered doing a, a global program not to send anything think about what we would send if we find a signal. This is still on hold. Uh, and by the way, Stephen Hawking was very much opposed to sending anything. So uh, as long as he was alive, we certainly wouldn't do anything. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. Uh, but let me turn to the program I think is kind of the most exciting for me personally, is Breakthrough Starshot. Uh, and this is the one I mostly want to talk about. So the question whether we can travel between the stars. Uh, this was announced on April 12th, 2016. It was the, the 55th anniversary of the first human flight into space by Yuri Gagarin. And by the way, Yuri Milner was named after Gagarin. He was born, Yuri Milner was born a few months later. Uh, and uh, uh, this was announced in New York. Uh, the, uh, uh, and the idea, we had done some significant studies to figure out could we travel on interstellar distances, and I'll get to those in a second. But the first question, is there any place to go? Uh, and when I went to graduate school last century, <laughs> a long time ago, uh, we were taught that maybe one in a thousand stars might have a solar system, and maybe one in a hundred or thousand of those would have an Earth. Uh, it turns out we were wrong. Uh, this is a mission that I had the honor of, of overseeing when I was the director of NASA Ames, the Kepler mission. And what we did is we looked at 100,000 stars like the sun, and we, we said, well, statistically, if they have solar systems, some of them are going to be edge on, and the planets will orbit in front of the star, and we'll see a small shadow. And I mean small shadow, really small. It's about 30 parts per million. Uh, but this was the first instrument that was capable of detecting that. And we found very interesting results. Essentially, every star in the galaxy has a solar system. And uh, about 25% of the ones like the Sun uh, have a planet the size of the Earth in its orbiting kind of an orbit like, like ours is that liquid water that exists on the surface. Now, since then, uh, this is the Wise Infrared Observatory. We've looked at other kinds of stars. 70% of the stars in the galaxy are what are called red dwarfs. They're maybe a tenth or two tenths of the mass of our sun. Uh, they only have maybe a thousandth or ten thousandth of light output. Uh, this is a system about 30 light years away. It was named TRAPPIST-1 because it was done at, uh, at uh, I think, the University of Edge, uh, and they were drinking TRAPPIST beer. 
uh, I'm told. Uh, but this particular star has seven planets the size of the Earth orbiting it. Uh, three of them are in the habitable zone. Uh, we now believe that essentially every one of these red dwarfs has a planetary system. So there may indeed be a lot of planets in the, in the galaxy on the Earth. Now, can we get there? This is Voyager, for those of you that watched the movie, Voyager. Uh, uh, it's traveling pretty fast. It's the furthest away object, human object that we still communicate with. Uh, but at the speed it's going, it would get to the nearest star if it was directed right in about 80,000 years. So it probably wouldn't get funding for an interstellar mission. Uh, in fact, to get to the nearest star, which is about 300,000 times further away from the sun, which by the way is Alpha Centauri, which I'll talk more about, uh, we need to go a thousand times faster. So we had a study group, and I'll talk a little more about it, said, can we send something to the nearest star, particularly Alpha Centauri? Can we take science data and send it back to Earth? And can we launch within a few decades of today? And the answer is you need to go really fast, uh, about 20% the speed of light. So can we do that? And that's it, I said a thousand times faster than we go today. Uh, we note that in the first and middle part of the 20th century, we accomplished that. Within you know a few decades, we got a hundred times faster. Can we do the same thing, or a thousand times faster? We do the same thing within the next few decades. So we assembled a committee of a lot of really neat people, including people that won that Swedish prize. Uh, uh, and we had a, a major study. And uh, we looked at all sorts of ideas, most of them stupid. Uh, the, uh, uh, actually, almost all of them stupid. Uh, and uh, just to show you how hard it is, uh, this is the only equation I'm going to put up. Uh, in Einstein's room, I have to put up an equation. This is the rocket equation. Uh, and just to kind of put it in context, uh, if you use fuel, there, there's a, a number called the specific impulse. And if you haven't had lectures already, you will. Uh, and this represents sort of the efficiency of, of rocket fuel. Today, the specific impulse uh, uh, for like a chemical rocket is three or 400. Uh, in order to do a reasonable interstellar mission, you need a specific impulse of a million. So again, we have about a factor of a thousand uh, to get there. Uh, so can we do that? Uh, <laughs> so the first answer was, like, this really sucks. Uh, however, well, let me put it in context. You could do it with a rocket like the, you know, we use today, but the amount of fuel you need is about the mass of the galaxy. Uh, so we kind of moved on from that one. <laughs> now, by the way, nuclear propulsion starts to get you in the region. A, 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 a nuclear fission engine is about maybe 100,000, 200,000 uh, specific impulse. A fusion engine, maybe half a million. So we're starting to get in that range, except that we don't know how to build a fusion engine. Although that's something we're watching. So we looked at other things. Uh, I really like antimatter. Anybody that watches Star Trek knows they use antimatter. The specific impulse of a matter-antimatter reaction is about five million. So you know, all you need to do is have a lot of antimatter. Uh, <laughs> and we can make antimatter today. You can do it in a particle accelerator. Uh, in fact, we've made like 10 to the 14th particles. Uh, but if you do your calculation, you need about 10 to the 28th particles. Uh, so we thought, okay, that's a neat idea, but it's a little further afield. Uh, so we went back to an old idea. Uh, this works, by the way. Uh, you kind of leave the energy behind and sort of capture it. Uh, and, and I really say this is an old idea because in 1610, uh, Kepler wrote a letter to Galileo where he talked about, you know, he said, with ships or sails built for heavenly, it was in Latin, so I, uh, I did take Latin when I flunked it. That uh, some will venture into the great vastness. Uh, I'm not sure what he was talking about, but it might have been this. Uh, light sails. Uh, light itself, when it bounces off of material, transfers momentum. Uh, this has been tested. This is a planetary society, privately funded mission uh, that demonstrated that light sails work. Uh, the Japanese Space Agency has also demonstrated that light sails can be used for propulsion. And I'm really hot on light sails. Uh, the trouble is, sunlight is too weak to get us to these kind of speeds that we need, uh, you can get to maybe hundreds of kilometers a second, but we need to go 60,000 kilometers a second. 
Uh, so when we look at this, the solution is, can you make the satellite really small? Can you leave the power uh, on Earth and the fuel on Earth? Can you attach a really small spacecraft or a light sail? And can we use, rather than sunlight, a laser beam? Uh, so this was really our objective. Uh, and, and can we develop that? Now the answer is yes. We can produce a laser beam that uh, uh, is pretty powerful. But what we need is about uh, 50 to 100 gigawatts. Uh, which is about three or four orders of magnitude more than we need. And we need a laser array about a kilometer square. Uh, and this is a really bad artist's conception of that. But for reasons I'll tell you, we think we can do this in a few decades. Uh, and by the way, if we're going to the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, which is only visible in the southern hemisphere, the laser array needs to be in the southern hemisphere. And when we asked where would we put this, we said Chile. Uh, I neglected to talk to the Chilean government. Uh, so I've been summoned. <laughs> I, I talked to the former president and the current president, and by the way, they're very supportive. They just want to be kept in the loop. <laughs> You're going to build one in my country? Uh, there's two developments to say this might work. First of all is the ability, that, and, and we're not paying for this, but to build really small uh, spacecraft. And the second is communications lasers are advancing very rapidly using photonics. Indeed, the cost for lasers is on kind of a Moore's law. Every two years, it, the cost of a laser is going down a factor of, of two. Uh, and the cost, or the power, is going up. Uh, so if you look at these curves, if this continues for another eight to ten years, we should be able to get 50 to 100 gigawatt lasers that cost you know, something like $10 billion, which is sort of a reasonable level for a space program. Uh, the, uh, the second thing is spacecraft. Now this is a typical communication spacecraft today. It weighs a few metric tons. Uh, a little bit large to send at 20% the speed of light. Uh, but we're seeing a, a trend to make spacecraft smaller. Of course, the, a lot of the excitement today is CubeSats that are a thousand times smaller. But can we go another factor of a thousand? Now if you have an electronic watch, the chip in that watch weighs a few grams or less. Uh, and it does most of the stuff a spacecraft uh, so we kind of look, can you build what we call a star chip? And the answer is yes. Uh, indeed, some of these have been tested. Uh, so this is a this is a prototype star chip. And, and by the way, this is Jamie Drew's fingers. <laughs> he has big fingers, so it looks even smaller. <laughs> and I brought one with me. So you know, I challenge people to, to, to carry your spacecraft in your pocket <laughs> and have it still work. <laughs> What? This? Well, this, uh, you know, this isn't imaginary. About 60% of the components in this are real. But uh, uh, this last year we launched a prototype, which was this. Uh, this is a mock up of it. But uh, uh, this was uh, actually the, the, this was a, the first kind of nanosat, chipset. Uh, it was constructed by students at Cornell University. Uh, we launched it, uh, you know, just about a year ago uh, on Latvia's first satellite. Once again, I forgot to tell the Latvian government. Uh, they've summoned me too. Uh, but it was launched on a, uh, on a on this satellite that was integrated by OHB and Bremen. Uh, it was launched on an Indian booster. Uh, and it was built in the US and smuggled out. Uh, actually, we had a permit. Uh, so this is a really neat thing. Now this was just a kind of a simple demonstration, but uh, this stuff is going forward. I think you know we're going to be able to, to really build grand class satellites. Uh, so the idea is you attach this chip to maybe a four meter light sail. Not like this. This is a stupid design. Um, I did it myself. Um, I'm a astronomer, not an engineer. Uh, but we just uh, released our request for a proposal for for the, the technology actually do this in real, so it, it's going forward. So our long-term schedule is to spend about 100 million over the next five years to determine the feasibility of the laser and the sale. Uh, if that works, we'll start in five or seven years to build a prototype system that might be about a billion dollars. Uh, uh, and, and then if that works, then we'd like to start building a full-scale system. Uh, the first Nano satellite may be launched in 30 years, uh, and I'll talk about where it might go. 
Uh, and so maybe 50 years or so from now, we'll have our first doing this in the uh, There's a lot of challenges, like this is really hard. Uh, and, I, and I mentioned one of the big issues is policy. Uh, this laser puts out about the equivalent of a small nuclear weapon every few minutes. Uh, so there'll be a few people concerned about it. So we've begun our discussions with the UN and a few others. Uh, so a lot of work to do on that. Uh, but again, uh, you know, we think this is all doable. Uh, we want to publish all the results and make this a, a, an open uh, competition. Uh, and I'll, I'll go through that in a minute. Uh, we have a third program, as I mentioned, that, that trying to see if there's life anywhere. Uh, is there an interesting place to go? Uh, now, most sort of speculation centers on Mars. Uh, in fact, recent results seem to suggest that there could be life there. It's probably below the surface. Uh, we do have a program that we're considering is to do privately funded missions in our solar system to look for life, uh, although we're more focusing on two other objects. Uh, Enceladus is one of the inner moons of Saturn. The, the, the Cassini mission found that there was uh, geysers uh, of water, actually seawater it looks like, uh, going into space. Uh, some of the recent results show that there are pretty sophisticated organic compounds. Uh, we'd like to think about going back and actually analyzing that. Uh, this is Europa, which is uh, one of the large moons of Jupiter. It, it also has a global ocean like Enceladus does with ice cover. Recent results have shown that there's water being ejected into space here as well. So we're looking at Europa. Uh, my favorite place to look in the solar system is Venus. Uh, we've all been told that the surface of Venus sucks. It's like you know 500 degrees centigrade. Uh, so it's you know it's kind of like the southwest U.S. Uh, but it turns out there's an interesting layer uh, at about 50 kilometers above the surface. The uh, the atmospheric density is about one atmosphere. Uh, the temperature is a little cooler than here, uh, maybe 20 degrees centigrade. Uh, the only problem is that it's in the middle of sulfuric acid clouds. Uh, except that recognizing on Earth some of the most interesting life forms, remember I talked about Archaea, uh, they live in sulfuric acid. Uh, so, and there's evidence in these clouds of, of kind of a mysterious ultraviolet absorption feature that's consistent with photosynthetic pigment. So this is another place we're looking at. Uh, my favorite place to look is Ceres. If, if you watch The Expanse, there's all sorts of interesting things going on in the asteroid belt. Uh, I can talk about that more if you'd like. Uh, let me turn to the nearest star system. This is the Alpha Centauri system. Uh, if you're in the southern hemisphere, it's the second brightest star in the sky. It's only 4.3 light years away, so it's like almost next door. Uh, but there are three stars in the system. Uh, Two of them are kind of like the sun. One's a little bigger, one's a little smaller. Uh, they orbit each other around 70 years. They were sitting in our solar system, and the bigger one is where the sun was, the other one would be kind of where Saturn is, a little further out. Uh, there aren't any planets known around it, although there have been some tentative detections. But what's really interesting is the third star, Proxima Centauri. Uh, it's a little red dwarf star. So little, it's only 10 times the size of Jupiter. Uh, but uh, we made our announcement, we didn't know about any planets orbiting the nearby stars. Uh, and this sort of shows it's sometimes better to be lucky than good. Uh, the uh, European Southern Observatory announced a few months after we did that there is a planet orbiting Proxima Centauri that's Earth sized in the habitable zone. Uh, they were nice enough to invite me, so we've been nice enough to give them $5 million. Uh, and uh, of course, they have a picture of it already, so I guess we don't need to go there. Uh, by the way, astronomical artists are really good. But uh, at any rate, we're building an instrument along with them that goes on, on one of these telescopes. Uh, these are the very large telescope in Chile. Uh, the uh, instrument is almost finished, and uh, it will be able to detect an Earth-sized planet orbiting Alpha Centauri A or B. Uh, now, by the way, I'm always amused, even though I am an astronomer, the names of telescopes. This is the next generation telescope. This is the, the extremely large telescope, larger than a very large telescope. It's 39 meters in diameter. And no shit, its original name was the overwhelmingly large telescope. <laughs> <laughs> they have a budget time. So, 
But this telescope is actually big enough that it can be, it can measure a spectrum of these planets orbiting the nearest star, and it might actually be able to prove their or show their light bearing. Uh, we also are working on, and I won't go into detail here, on a spacecraft that can potentially measure measure the mass. We're working with the Italian Space Agency and the Japanese Space Agency and and the University of Sydney uh, to work this one. Uh, I can talk more about that later. Uh, the last thing we do is we have an annual conference. Uh, and, in fact, I will announce here that, that we will try to invite and pay for at least one ISU summer student and, and uh, some master students as well to come to this conference next year. It's held at Stanford University. Uh, when we talk about these neat things, uh, this last year it was, uh, we talked about exotic life possibilities, including machine life, advances in propulsion. And to me, one of the most interesting things is what would an alien really look like? Uh, you know, I, I want to tell the jokes about the people I dated in college. <laughs> <laughs> they said they dated an alien. It's me. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, we're also working with, uh, with uh, space agencies around the world. Uh, every year we invite the heads of science of uh, all the world space agencies. Uh, so we're intending to work with, with various governments to make this stuff happen. If all goes well, maybe about 50 years from now, uh, we'll have our first image of, of, the, of another star. If we're really lucky, we'll find like aliens there. Probably not. Uh, but uh, uh, it's a really cool project. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. And, uh, and uh, really, ISU is really cool. I've been involved in it for you know, almost 30 years. And looking forward to your help on making our stuff real. Thanks. Somewhere between 10 and 50,000 Gs, which is hard, but uh, there are artillery shells that are today that take 100,000 Gs. Uh, one of the other interesting things that has been done is if you might have read about spin launch. Uh, it's a really cool idea where they, they spin up to Mach 7 a rocket, uh, but if you calculate that, it takes 10,000 Gs, and they've already done tests. Uh, electronics are pretty robust, so we think that's not a problem. Uh, you know, obviously that's technology that's going to work for humans, uh, but uh, uh, the you know that's a challenge, but it's not the biggest one. It means we have to have really robust stuff. Mark, so since you're at university, I'm going to ask a question that probably most people here have been events and seeing this great stuff. Like, uh, what are the qualifications that break through this that you and the people that join the network? Well, yeah, that's a. Uh, you have some money. <laughs> Is, uh, are you like Bezos' brother? That would help. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the main thing is we're looking for. We, we, there are three topics that were our initial request for proposals. We'll, we'll spend about sixty or most of a hundred million. The first one is how to build a cheap, really powerful laser. And since it's on the ground, you have to combine the beams and get it to the atmosphere. So we've uh, we've just finished writing the first dozen or so contracts with that. Most of those are at universities. The second area is how to take this chip and integrate it with a light sail and its materials. Uh, how do you build this laser or this light sail that can take 1,500 gigawatts without falling apart? It has to reflect most of the light and not absorb any of it. That's mostly material science. Uh, we're about to select the first dozen or so contracts there. Most of those, again, are universities because it's materials, but there's a couple of companies 
uh, and a few startups looking at it. Uh, so, you know, that's the second one. The third one is communications. You know, it's like really hard to communicate back from Alpha Centauri. Uh, the way we think it might work is on that little chip, it's a small laser. And, uh, you know, after you fly by Alpha Centauri and take a few hundred images or, of the planet, uh, you have to send it back. So we have to turn that chip around, and there's four small, small lasers that are photonic thrusters. You can turn it and lock it on the Earth. Uh, and so we have to use either the sail or deploy an optical element. Uh, we then send the signal back, you know, 4.3 years later, we receive it, but we have to use the transmit array as a receiver, because we need a square kilometer telescope to close the loop. Uh, that's like really hard. I think that's the hardest one. So we're about to release in the next few months our request for proposal for that. So if you have some expertise in any of those areas, uh, you know, when those requests for proposals are released, uh, do send us a proposal. Uh, so I think that's the best way to get involved in those. Uh, the other programs, uh, we're working uh, you know, with the astronomy community uh, to look at the nearby stars and planets. So, you know, there's, this is one of the key challenges of astronomy. Uh, spacecraft, to go to look at our own solar system, uh, uh, I think we're looking to do this cheap. So, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if NASA did it, it would cost a few billion. If ESA, maybe five. Uh, the, uh, the, you know, collective decision making is expensive. Uh, the, uh, if, if Bezos did it, it might cost 50 to 100 million. So we're going to try to do it for those kind of levels. So I'm, we're really interested in creative ways to do things. These will be requests for proposals as well. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to get involved. Uh, my staff is really small. In fact, half of us here, uh, <laughs> Jamie and myself. Uh, we have another six or eight people that work on the prize, but uh, you know, it's uh, and, and we're mostly bureaucrats. Uh, I have to say more than bureaucrats. We mostly ride on airlines around the world. So uh, I think I spent $150,000 on United last year. So, you know, at least I'm working for a billionaire. I go business class. <laughs> Hi. Um, so, will the light field remain attached to the chip once it passes uh, outside of the solar system? Will that slow it down in your Will that unlock the uh, transmission back? Now that's a very interesting question, and that's one of the trades we're going to do when these studies are starting. Uh, it, it, it turns out it doesn't really slow it down much. The calculations show that when, you're, when you go through interstellar space uh, at point two C, you hit gas, uh, hydrogen gas mostly, and uh, but not a lot. That may slow it down at a few tenths of a percent in the course of a few years. Uh, it turns out it may actually be an interesting source of power because it'll keep one side of the sail relative to the other. So you may want to keep the sail. Uh, the other way to provide power is a small plutonium uh, you know, battery on it. Uh, you know, that raises issues that we just do not get into. So if we can heat it, we can power it with the interstellar space. So we keep the sail in those cases. The problem with the sail is that it, the other thing in interstellar space is dust. And if you hit a piece of dust, you know, that's bad. Uh, so one of the ideas we're looking at is you know, can you kind of distribute the functions of the chip throughout the sail? So if you, if you lose, you know, you might have multiple components or something. Uh, so that's one of the pluses. The other thing is that, you know, you don't really need it. Uh, but on the other end, you would then have to deploy an optical, you know, a few tens of centimeter optical thing to fire it back. So I'd say it's probably 70% likely to keep the sail with us. You know, the question of what kind of instruments, uh, the number one instrument is a camera. Uh, we'd like to get images of the target planet that have maybe a 100 kilometer resolution on the planet so you can see continents, maybe forests, and so on. Uh, we might be able to put a low resolution spectrometer on it. You, you, you'd like to see if we can find evidence of you know, maybe chlorophyll or some other photosynthetic pigment. Uh, possibly we could put a uh, particle detector 
or a magnetometer. Uh, the, right now, that's sort of out of our technology capability, but it could be in the next uh, few uh, decades. Now, I might add that we're not just sending one ship. We're going to send hundreds of thousands because uh, we're probably going to lose a lot of them. So it may be that you can put a camera on one, maybe an infrared camera on the second. So. Okay. Um, so you mentioned all the observations you are doing are you closer yes. optical. Um, is it just that you guys are actually taking the measurements or are how are the data scientists that you're having a look at doing anything different than we've done in the past? That's a good question. Uh, for the uh, SETI data, we're, we'd like to record as much information as we can to make it available. The trouble is the amount of data we are taking is you know, like way too much. We can record maybe a, a percent. So what we have done is we have built some very sophisticated correlators. And so what we do when we go to an observatory, we put these correlators, they're looking for correlations in frequency and in time. And we, we set some thresholds so we only keep the data that we, uh, that we can. Now, one thing we just started doing is uh, with the Parks Radio Telescope, we're actually, you know, and because the center of the galaxy is easily visible in the southern hemisphere. We're scanning the plane of the, of the galaxy and recording all the data. But we only can do that you know, once a year. They, they have a new uh, uh, multi-element array. Uh, that data we're going to try to do once a year and, and so that we don't throw anything away and people can look for it as an archive. Uh, so it's, uh, the, we are really very anxious to get people to look at this. Uh, one of the groups that we've been talking to is uh, the uh, Israeli security people that know a lot about looking for signals and noise. Uh, so we're, you know, we've, they proposed to us to work with us. They claim they can find all sorts of signals that nobody else can, which they probably can. Uh, they won't tell us how, but, uh, uh, but uh, and I've been trying to get the U.S. National Security Agency interested, but nobody will admit they work for them. Uh, so it's, but, but that's why we're kind of putting as much as we can online and hoping that you know, somebody will say, oh, I just, uh, I actually run a car wash and I just happened to look at this data with a sophisticated method and found this. Uh, <laughs> oh, you live near Fort Meade, Maryland, you say? <laughs> and anyhow, it's, 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 that, that's a really good question. We think the ability to handle a lot of data now is really advancing. So that's one of the technologies we hope to increase. Okay. Uh, I think you're kind of Yeah, it's a few tens of bits. What? What kind of proposals do you have to make that? Well, so far it's just a theoretical. If you have like a 50 centimeter transmitter or aperture and a watt pulse laser, and then you use your receiver as a kilometer square, then you could just calculate you get. 200 bits per second, and it's uh, the uh, so it's it's right at the at the edge of doability, and that doesn't go through all the errors. So that's why we're intending to to look at it, it to, is to submit a, uh, a request for proposal later in the year. But it's it's it, it, like I said, it's very very tight on that budget. I think it's the hardest problem. You know, maybe you got to build a bigger laser, maybe you go slower. Maybe you have to have a bigger receiver, uh, but it's it, it's within the realm of feasibility. I guess it's you know, but you you, you put your finger on the hardest problem in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. So you're, um, the that happened to Einstein's audience too. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, artist rendering of laser beams that you shot into the sky reminded me of uh, what's been happening in the Idaho solar collector in California that pulls up 6,000 right. birds a year. Yeah. How many birds did I, this one kill? What could be the potential impact on the First of all, we tend to put it in the Atacama Desert. There's not very many birds. It's, it's the driest desert on Earth. Uh, second is uh, that it turns out the power density over the array is pretty low. It's, it's well below the atmospheric breakdown. It's probably not good for the bird's eyes. 
uh, the uh, or for people riding an airplane. Uh, so one of the things that, that we're looking at is how we, you know, have firing control to minimize it. But at least in our initial look, it, it looks like, you know, a, a bird flying through that probably would survive. Uh, now, by the way, you're talking to somebody that one of his last missions to the moon was the, uh, the uh, uh, landing mission. And if you look at that, the uh, you see the rocket taking off, and there's a little spread eagle figure that's a frog. And uh, uh, it turns out there was a rain the night before, and some poor frog was sitting in the, in the pond. And my wife asked me, is, how's the frog? And I said, oh, I'm sure he's fine here. <laughs> she didn't believe me either. But, but you know, I, I, I think that's a very legitimate question of when you do, you know, these instruments. I mean, the, the problem is here around Europe about the, you know, power from, from windmills. And, uh, uh, you know, I think we need to do everything we can to minimize it. But, but it, it, at least our preliminary look is the Atacama Desert is, is pretty devoid of of, of, you know, bird life. And objects in, in orbit, would they be effective? Uh, probably not. That's another thing I'd look at. If they're in low orbit, because you fly through the beam so fast. If you're close to the focus, we're at about 10%. You know, it's a few suns. So now, if you're deep in space, there's a problem. Uh, and so one of the things we, we need to do is to work out a global decision-making process where there's firing, you know, go, no, go. Uh, that's done today for rocket launches to make sure there aren't airplanes or ships downrange. Uh, so, you know, on my list, one of the big challenges is policy. Is uh, how do we set up a system that that you know we'd only fire a few minutes a day, but it's still a, it's still a potential issue. Uh, I might add that this laser is powerful enough that it's uh, it would be ideal to protect the Earth from asteroids. Uh, you can push a very large asteroid enough to get it out of the way with this laser. So it's, uh, you know, that could be another use of it. It also can send, if it can send a, a gram, two tenths of the speed of light, it can send hundreds of kilograms and, you know, much faster than 10 a day. So this is something that is really revolutionary new capability that was first proposed in the 60s to use uh, light sails for this purpose. But with every technology, there's a lot of downsides that look at. Good point. What, what do you plan to do to compensate for the Earth moving around the sun as a lunar axis? And how will you, like, say, where the jet is? Yeah. <laughs> Our current view is that we would have a mothership that would be in a highly elliptical orbit, that where the uh, the apogee is pointed towards Alpha Centauri at about 60,000 kilometers. So we release the chip. Uh, and you would then fire, you know, at, at the position where you're, uh, you know, you sort of, at the 50% point, you're directed in the right direction. We think that we can direct it within an arc second, which is an astronomical unit at Alpha Centauri. Uh, on board the chip, the small orientation lasers uh, over, you know, the 20 years or so can move maybe up to an astronomical unit. So we can correct for a little of it. But that's one of the key challenges that we've asked people to look at in the uh, in the laser device. Uh, we already have figured out that the sail should be not like that stupid diagram, but a sphere, and uh, the uh, the laser beam pattern should look like a torus. So you you're stable in the center of it, uh, and then over the few minutes you take to fire it, you would you would adjust it. Uh, you, you know, it, after a few minutes you're about five million kilometers going 20 percent C, so you're out of range. Uh, so we've got to figure out how to keep it in that orientation. But we could probably change the beam pattern. That's one of the challenges. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned something about the potential for liquid water under the surface of the Enceladus. Yes. The question is, do we actually find liquid water under the surface? Would this somehow change the definition of a habitable zone and how does it work? Well, that's a good question. I mean, we know there's water under the surface of a number of these objects, uh, including Enceladus. I mean, the, the Cassini gravity, you know, sort of experiments showed that, that, 
there's an ocean underneath it. The fact that you see uh, geysers of, of water uh, kind of proves that. Uh, the same with Europa. So there are probably other objects that seem to have it. Uh, and it, what the, what's interesting, I think, from all this is that your question is exactly spot on. That the habitable zone may be a lot different than we think. Uh, so, you know, looking at other places, you know, first in our own solar system will begin to tell us that. I mean, Venus is inside the habitable zone, but it may have life in the upper atmosphere. Uh, certainly Enceladus and Europa are outside it. Uh, I put Ceres up there. It apparently used to be a water world, and at least for maybe up to a billion years after it was formed. Uh, and, it, you know, one of the arguments is that life emerged on something like Ceres and that it was spread to other places. So it's, this is a really fascinating question of, of where we look for life. I mean, Pluto seems to have an ocean underneath, you know, you know uh, pretty thick ice crust. So it could be the outer solar system that's more interesting than the inner ones. Uh, yeah. uh, do you take into account other scientific objectives like uh, going to plot the dwarf planets first or uh, the Oort cloud or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it, you know, I didn't get into the detail, but you know, clearly if we can start going at 1% the speed of light or even a tenth the speed of light, we can access the outer solar system, access Kuiper Belt objects as well as Oort cloud objects. Uh, indeed, the picture I showed uh, of the announcement of, of Starshot Freeman Dyson is there, and, and he, he he is unpredictable. And he said, "Well, it's stupid to go to Alpha Centauri; we should just go to the Oort Cloud." Uh, but uh, one of the more interesting early targets, uh, there's a point about 500 astronomical units out that uh, where the sun acts as a gravitational lens. And so there's a number number of studies by the Keck Institute that suggests that if we could put an optical system there, and our technology could do that, uh, if you're placed in the right direction where the sun uh, is lined with, a, say, a nearby solar system, you might be able to image the planets. So there's a lot of very exciting early things in that. And I, uh, you know, we, we, we decided to put a really stretch goal, but it, maybe some of these other things that, you know, might not have to wait 30 years. Which is good for me, because I'm an old guy. Well, most of those studies, they're well done, but bullshit. Because <laughs> uh, we don't know anything. Uh, I, I mean, you know, to get back to some of the previous questions, you know, we would never have predicted from analysis that we'd find, uh, you know, oceans in the outer solar system. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm an observational astronomer, and, and I think it's important to still look. And, uh, uh, you know, I know there are people that have done these analyses and say, well, uh, you know, planets can't evolve fast enough and, you know, the, the habitable zone is only just now becoming reasonable. I mean, one of the interesting things in that is that the sun is anomalously metal rich. And so it may be that we just finally had enough material to form earth sized planets. I know that's one of the arguments. Uh, so I would look at those analyses is awesome. and say they, they all make about six <coughs> assumptions, any one of which can be grossly wrong. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, I mean, I've, I've written papers like that too. They're kind of fun to stir the pot to press releases. Well, Pete, I'd love to thank you all the time for being with us this evening. Thank you. I see you guys here. By the way, I might try to come back to the last week. <laughs>